The journey, which began amid the splendors of royal palaces, ended in the country lanes surrounding the family estate. The crowds were quiet and controlled, but they would take away a personal memory of a moment in history. Outside the iron gates of Walthorpe Park, they waited for a last glimpse of the coffin of the princess, the last stage in its public journey. Here it would pass to her family, so they could mourn in private. The Spencers were bringing her home to be buried where the family is embedded in English history. The coffin passed from public view and they let it go. a year since Diana, Princess of Wales, was buried here in the park at Altrup. Until now, her brother, Earl Spencer, has only allowed her family and closest friends to visit her island grave. Diana's element was water. Uh, I love the idea of her being buried, surrounded by that element. It's the most beautiful place. It's very peaceful. It's... Uh, surrounded by trees planted by members of her family and by herself. Everyone who goes there just sort of nods and says, yeah, it's perfect. And I, I think it's a, a fitting place for somebody who appreciated the beautiful things in life. Tell me about the memorial you're creating here. Why did you feel you had to do it? After the, uh, Diana's death, it became clear that this was becoming a, a point of pilgrimage for people who cared about her. Masses of flowers at the gates, people just gravitating towards here. So we decided, first of all, we had to limit the numbers, otherwise the whole area would be swamped. And then secondly, I took the decision that we should do something here to honour her. I mean, if we, her family, can't put together something tasteful and meaningful for people, then I don't know who can. The memorial will only be open for 60 days a year from the 1st of July, Diana's birthday. However, most of the tickets for this season sold out weeks ago. Over 140,000 people have paid £9.50 to visit this site. Earl Spencer has converted these old stables into six exhibition rooms, each celebrating a different aspect of Diana's life, using films, paintings and personal mementos. The buildings are Grade 1 listed, so all the works have had to be carried out with great care even down to using horsehair plaster. After Diana's death, all of her belongings were removed from Kensington Palace and brought here to Altrup. From school reports to her famous wedding dress, nothing was left behind. And it's from these things, the remnants of her life, that the exhibition has been created. Selecting the objects, I, I tried to turn to an advantage the fact that I didn't know the princess and I'd never met her. And so my response to objects, I, I tried to put in the position of, of the way um, a kind of a visitor to the exhibition would feel about them. And if, if I felt a kind of emotion or a sort of feeling of sadness or poignancy about an object, and I always try to kind of keep that as, as a sort of first thought and think, yes, this should go in. Hi. So this is the final selection? It is. It is. Well, what I've laid out here are the objects that will go into the childhood room. This is just poignant really it's not it's not upsetting in any way it's just a little girl's collection of things isn't it oh it is it is and we very much like this little letter which we thought we'd put in dear mummy and daddy 
I hope you had a nice journey and that you're enjoying your holiday. We had a power cut on Monday and I went to bed with a candle in my room. That's sweet, isn't it? It is. Lots of love, Diana. That's lovely. What was your childhood, yours and Diana's, like? There were five children in my family, um, but the middle one, uh, a boy called John, died. So it was very much two halves of the family, my two eldest sisters, then a slight gap, and then Diana and me. Um, and growing up, I don't... I, Sarah and Jane, my other sisters, were, were very much a sort of... Uh, in the background, they were at boarding school. And so it was Diana and me, um, Charles and Diana, uh, we later became a different Charles and Diana, um, and uh, we had a very happy time, lots of pets. I had my memory refreshed of our childhood quite recently because I found all my father's cine footage, cine film footage of our childhood. He was a great amateur photographer. So um, that was very moving. It took me back to those years. on children. Um, I think it, it certainly did have an effect on us, but day-to-day -day existence was happy. We had lots of friends. We had um, very uh, privileged background, really. Lovely, huge grounds, gardens. We used Sandringham Park as a sort of extended garden. Um, we rode our horses. We had our dogs and cats and everything, and, and it was a happy time. What was your relationship with Diana like? I mean, was she a, a kind of surrogate mother in a way? Diana was very maternal at a very young age. And um, I think she quite enjoyed having a baby brother and treating me like a sort of living doll almost. And uh, no, we had, I mean, she was very affectionate towards me. And I know that I got a letter from my schoolmistress uh, when we were both very young children, went to school in Kings Lynn in Norfolk. And she wrote and said, she remembers my first day at school so much because Diana was totally distracted the whole day and kept saying, how's Charles doing? Is he all right? And in the end, she said, for goodness sake, Diana, go and check for yourself. And then she left the class and came to see me in my classroom. And then apparently she went back to the headmistress and said, he's fine, with a big grin on her face. So she was very caring and very loving. And um, she had that natural affinity with children, which she had all her life. And I suppose I was just lucky I was her younger brother. You called her Brian, I understand, from the... The dim-witted <laughs> snail and the magic roundabout. Yes, well, we had, we did have some names for each other. That was, that was only pulled out in extreme cases <laughs> of anger. Um, but uh, no, we, I mean, it was just a, the, the knockabout element of a family life was the same as with anyone else. Why did you call her Dutch? Dutch was short for Duchess. We called her that throughout her life. Um, there seems to be a sort of perception that it's because she was very grand as a little girl. But I remember it being because. Um, she particularly identified with the, the lead cat in the Aristocats, and, uh, who was called Duchess. Um, uh, but anyway, it, it just snowballed from there, and it, it was her nickname in the family and among her close friends um, all her life. And what, what sort of girl was she? Is it possible to sum her up? She was very... Uh, she had star quality as a child. She could... She was always striking poses for da with dancing... Um, uh, steps and everything around the place, and, and she was a sort of she was very energetic. To show off, well, not the show off is uh, is the, a cruel way of saying it. I think she was she was a, 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 a junior star, really. Yeah, she had she had real appeal. very strong symbol putting somebody on an island you know, it's an unmarked grave and we really wanted to um, not to um, just to keep everything feeling as calm and um, contemplative as possible 
not to um, pump the atmosphere up in any way. We got um, 500 uh, white water lilies from Stowe. Oh, lovely. And they're going... Uh, and when do they flower? What months? They'll be in flower in July and August. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Well, white flowers are her thing, actually, so that couldn't yeah. be better. And on the island itself, we planted uh, 100 white rambling roses of various different varieties, and they just go up into the trees and be very much part of what's already there. So That's great. And they'll have one sort of flash and then... Is that yeah. July and August again, is it? That's um, July, really. July. Yeah. yeah. Did I ever tell you about the swans? What happened there? No. It's the most extraordinary thing. I had a dream. It was in the week between Diana's death and the funeral. And I had a dream that there should be four black swans on this lake. So I got up early the next morning. I went to see Edward, the agent in the estate office. And I said, uh, Edward, can you track down four black swans? And he said, Oh, you've heard, have you? And I said, heard what? He said, we had a call on the machine last night um, from some man who's got uh, four swans, black swans, he wants to donate them to the oh, lake here. It's the most bizarre mm. thing. Just mm. a complete coincidence, really. It was here on the estate, when she was 16, that Diana first met Prince Charles. The two families have long been closely related. Diana's father was equerry to both George VI and, after his death, to his daughter Elizabeth II. In fact, the Queen is godmother to the present Earl Spencer. Prince Charles often stayed here at the house, first as a guest of Diana's sister, Lady Sarah, and later with Diana. The union between the Spencers and the Windsors was the perfect royal match but it produced an unhappy marriage which ended in bitter divorce. Do you think it's true in a sense that her temperament wasn't suited to the, the disciplines of the job ahead? I mean, she'd, she'd had a, a, a sort of free-spirited childhood with perhaps not a lot of consistent discipline. I don't know. I think from the word go, she did a really good job and the public warmed to that. I mean, she could have just sat in a palace eating chocolates and watching soap operas, but she actually got out there and got stuck in with um, a lot of meaningful issues. Um, she didn't... She didn't do the obvious things, maybe, but that was her style and that was her appeal. Um, nobody's going to look sort of uh, glamorous doing AIDS leprosy, homelessness, landmines. These are not glamorous causes. These are not things which you can just have a little coffee morning over and, and raise a few hundred pounds and move on. I mean, she got stuck in, and, and I think that's, that was the key to her appeal worldwide, is that people realised what she could have done and what she actually did and contributed. Was she glad to sort of throw it all off when she could? I mean, did she like to, to you know, be herself as much as possible? Oh, yeah, she had an incredible sense of humour. Um, she knew all the latest jokes, etc. No, she was great fun to be with. She was a really entertaining person. I'm not saying she didn't have her down moments too, but if you think of the pressures on her from all sorts of directions, it's not surprising. But overall, I mean, just in her downtime, as it were, yeah, she was great fun, always laughing. I mean, the, the laugh was... Uh, that, that's something I'll never forget. It was so deep. It came from right down inside her. It's very special. After her divorce, it was reported that she asked you for a house here at Altrup, that she wanted some sort of bolt hole yes. in the grounds, and you refused. And yes. Was that true? I refused one particular house in the park uh, on the basis that the press and the police attention would have been unsustainable. And at the time, I felt I was doing the right thing because I was protecting my children's privacy. I didn't want the press camped outside their door. What do you feel now? Do you regret it or do you still feel... You no, because I'd offered, I, I'd offered a, such a wide selection. But it was typical, Diana, to... The fact I said no to one thing, she'd just say, right, well, I'm not, not going to look at the others, which is fine. But, I mean, I, I did offer her a selection of 100 houses. <laughs> <laughs> it's just unfortunate she didn't like the one that... Uh, she didn't get the one she wanted. I mean, could she be a bit of a prima donna? Was she a bit tricksy? No, but I mean, it, there are very few people who said no, I think. That's the problem, <laughs> and I did. <laughs> but it didn't cause a, a sort of lasting rift with Oh, it? it caused a rift for a few months, yeah. But I was quite relaxed about it. I mean, I was ready. I mean, I knew the 
phone would go again one day and she'd be back to normal and it was fine and that's what happened what did she just come on one day and see yeah as though nothing had happened really? but that's fine i mean that was diana and actually my mother made a very good point to me the other day she said you've got to understand that as family we're about the only people she could really get her um aggro off against without it becoming public i mean she could say whatever she mm. wanted to the me freedom to behave badly you know, right? she could behave how she wanted with us and we'd known her all our life it was you know it's just a safety valve really it's no big deal i don't regret it i made the right decision uh, I th i'd have loved to have accommodated her anywhere on the estate but not in the park i just couldn't do it <laughs> Charles Spencer was only 27 when he inherited the 89 million pound estate. When his father, the 8th Earl, died, he was buried in the family crypt in the local church. And it was there, next to him, that Diana was also to be buried. But due to the scale of public mourning after her death and worries about security at the small country church, her brother was forced to make other plans. Diana had left specific instruction that she should be buried in a coffin, not cremated. Now that meant that we had to keep the ventilation going in the crypt. Um, and that obviously means that there's access to the crypt at some level. So I was very worried about the security implication. I was very worried about the impact on the local village. So I don't know, I just, I, I woke up one morning and I went to see the two managers of the estate, I said, look, I've decided she's going to be buried in the park, and I think the island's the best place. And they both smiled and they said, well, we've come to the same conclusion, it's the only thing we can do. How did you hear about her accident? I was in Cape Town, and um, my telephone went in the middle of the night, and I pitched up and it went dead, and then it went again, and it was uh, one of the managers who runs the estate here. Uh, who lived in a house I used to live in here and he said oh, I've just had one of the Sunday papers on and they said that your sister and Dodie Fired have been in a car crash in Paris and that it's serious so I got up out of bed and I went downstairs and turned on the uh, television and flicked between CNN and BBC World and both of them had had independent witnesses at that stage who said they'd seen her walk away and that she'd probably broken her arm or and, and, and had a gash in her thigh so I thought, well, that's serious, but and I, w I stayed up watching for about an hour, and that seemed to be the consensus that she was fine. And then the telephone went, and it was my sister Sarah, my elder sister, and she said, I'm afraid it is serious, um, we think it's brain damage. So I said, okay, and then I rang up my middle sister Jane, whose husband works at Buckingham Palace, and I thought he might have a better picture of what was going on. And Jane said, oh, hang on, um, Robert's just on the other line to Paris. And then she stopped talking, and then uh, I heard Robert go, Oh, no. And I remember just sitting there in shock for several hours. And then my children came through, my three little girls. And uh, I said, I've got some awful news. I'm afraid Aunt Diana's been killed. And the little, what, little middle twin of mine, she looked at me and she said, and she just smiled and she said, but not in real life, Daddy. <laughs> and then I, I thought, well, the only way I'm going to show it to them was to show them on television. I, I turned on the television and there was the car being pulled out of the tunnel. And even then, that meant nothing to them, because, you see, they watch things on television which are fiction, and they didn't really get it, you know. And then I flew back that night. And it was while flying back, I was sitting on the plane, and um, I was in a bit of a state, and uh, the air stewardess kept sort of bringing me handfuls of Kleenex and things. And then I started to try and deal with practicalities, and I thought, well, you know, we've got to have a funeral now, and somebody's got to speak and somebody's got to read a lesson and all this and I had my address book and I went through it looking for somebody to make a speech about Diana and there's just no one I, I just went up page after page and I thought well they, they can't do it they can't do it and I just sat there and, and I suddenly had this ghastly realization that it was going to have to be me how did you cope in the in the, the days leading up to the funeral I suppose you were very busy I there was a lot to do. I mean, it was still a family funeral, even though it obviously looked far from that. And I was liaising with uh, some uh, a colonel at Buckingham Palace over the details and, and, and making sure that the right hymns were selected. All my family were helping, I might add. It wasn't just me. Whose idea was it to, to walk behind the coffin? 
Um, that was, uh, I, I think it was probably the Queen's or Prince Charles's idea. <laughs> It's something I'll never, ever get over. It's totally traumatic. And having my two nephews next to me and not knowing how they were doing, trying to keep an eye on them, see they were OK. Two boys walking behind their mother's body in front of tens of millions of people. I mean, it's, uh, it's not something I, I would have chosen, really. But there we are. walking down a tunnel of grief and you could feel the intensity of that grief every footstep and at the same time you couldn't identify you couldn't put a human face on the grief because you couldn't look left or right I was looking straight down a gun barrel and then every now and then just checking the boys were okay and you'd walk a hundred yards in complete silence but with this grief bearing down on you and then somebody would scream in uh, almost in tortured pain, they'd bellow, which was just awful. And then other people would be sobbing, others would applaud, and then the silence again. I mean, it just seemed endless to me. Did it, did it help at all having the princes there to help? Yeah, I, it did in a way. I mean, I would have been in tears if they hadn't been there. And I, because they weren't, I mean, I being a generation senior to them, I couldn't, couldn't cry if they weren't. But it was horrendous. And I, I mean, my admiration for those two boys is, is without bound now. I mean, how they could have got through it. It's the most amazing display of courage that um, I'll ever see, I imagine. I stand before you today the representative of a family in grief, in a country in mourning, before a world in shock. I'm always someone who's really guarded their privacy, and the thought of having to speak was a bit daunting. I didn't know what I was going to say at all. And then I woke up uh, on the Wednesday morning between the death and the funeral at about 4.30 in the morning, and I just got up and I wrote it. And I'd finished it about an hour and a half later, and it stood. That's what I read out. What did you feel like as you were about to step up there? Well, uh, just before I had to go up, I, I think it was um, the Prime Minister read a lesson, then Elton John uh, performed. And actually, luckily, I'd heard him rehearse the day before, so I was prepared for how emotional it would be. Uh, and then I walked up there and um, started to speak. And I wasn't so sure, and I was just talking, and, and I tripped up over a word quite early on. And then it was almost like I totally relaxed then, because it was almost like a voice said, no, you've got something to say, say it. And that was it, just did it. And I, it was, it was uh, not a problem to deliver it. Uh, I, I didn't think about the audience and how many people were there or whatever, I just read it and did it. Towards the end it got very difficult. When I started to talk to William and Harry over their mother's coffin, I mean, phew, that was very, very upsetting. And I only just made it to the end of the speech. I think another paragraph and I would have been completely inaudible. On behalf of your mother and sisters, I pledge that we, your blood family, will do all we can to continue the imaginative and loving way in which you are steering these two exceptional young men, so that their souls are not simply immersed by duty and tradition, but can sing openly as you planned. We fully respect the heritage into which they have both been born and will always respect and encourage them in their royal role. But we, like you, recognize the need for them to experience as many different aspects of life as possible to arm them spiritually and emotionally for the years ahead. You talked about, you know, how you pledged that you, her blood family, would do everything you could to help William and Harry's souls to sing, I think you said, rather than being immersed in, in duty and tradition. Now, I mean, that that's a hard blow to take when you're actually sitting there 
listening to that as Prince Charles was. I mean, the, the, the implication that he couldn't help their souls to sing. Really, I was picking up on the magic of Diana. I'm not... This was a tribute to Diana. It was a eulogy. I wasn't... Um, taking any swipes at anyone. But you can't say immersed in duty and tradition without realising that that is loaded. I mean, you, you, you're a wordsmith. You, you understand what words mean, what their implications are. Well, I don't back down from the words at all. But what I'm saying is that Diana brought to their lives something quite different and wonderful. And I was just offering in any way that uh, her family, her surviving family, could help to perpetuate that, I was offering it to them. I yeah, by the time you stepped out that abbey, you were being hailed on the one hand as a national hero and uh, on the other as a, as a catalyst that, that might bring down the monarchy. Right, mm -hmm. well, obviously I was unaware of that. Um, I mean, was, it, I mean, was it a complete shock to you what, what was made of that speech then? I'm, look, I'm pleased that I said what I said for Diana and judging by the letters I get from the public, I had 200,000 letters people were in agreement that it was it needed to be said. But you must have known that, 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 that this was dynamite. Some of the things oh, that no, you were saying, you must have known. No, not at all. Well, you must be naive then. No, not naive. I just wrote what I felt to be honestly true. You know, I, I support the Queen enormously, but individual members of the royal family I don't actually know at all well. So it's, although I respect their position and everything, I, don't, I genuinely don't know them, so I can't have a strong opinion. The only two members of the royal family who I really now on a level of <laughs> any significance of my nephews and I'm certainly not going to um, sit here and criticise their relatives. The point is that they can be in no doubt that I am sincere in my wish to help them in any way they want. And, you know, they'll be at an age soon where they'll do their own thing and see whoever they want to see. And, you know, if, I'm some, if they see me as some sort of interfering uncle they don't want to see, I'm sure they'll make it very clear. How have they been this year? Are they, are they okay? Well, I mean, <coughs> they're very special boys, as I said in my tribute. And I think they've done remarkably well. But beyond that, I mean, I think it would be betraying confidences to, to say anything else. But uh, I think this country is extremely lucky to have them as two princes. They're fantastic boys. In fact, William's a man now, really. There is no doubt that she was looking for a new direction in her life at this time. She talked endlessly of getting away from England, mainly because of the treatment that she received at the hands of the newspapers. I don't think she ever understood why her genuinely good intentions were sneered at by the media, why there appeared to be a permanent quest on their behalf to bring her down. It is baffling. My own and only explanation is that genuine goodness is threatening to those at the opposite end of the moral spectrum. It is a point to remember that of all the ironies about Diana, perhaps the greatest was this. A girl given the name of the ancient goddess of hunting was, in the end, the most hunted person of the modern age. Your remarks about you know, the press hounds who turned her into the most hunted person on earth. Mm. Uh, are you still bitter about the way you feel they treated her? <clears throat> Well, I don't know if bitter is the right word. I mean, it's just devastating when you're somebody's brother to see them being chewed up by anything. And, and, and it was my duty that day to point out this very significant factor in her life, which she had found incredibly hard to deal with. When I spoke about her tearful despair, I mean, that is what we were dealing with here. And just complete loss of hope and, uh, and, and I, I think that the, the press really did hurt her in her life, yeah, really hurt her. To an extent which you or I would find illogical because we, should, we would have thought she could rise above it, but she, she did have this insecurity which made her very vulnerable to the press. She learned to play the media game though, didn't she? She, she, she was able to exploit the media for her own ends. I think if you're faced with a sort of juggernaut like the media, you can either be squashed by it, or you can try and harness some of its power. And I think she harnessed it for the good of her causes, yes, and I think that's a good thing. Elsewhere in the speech you talked about your 
gratitude to God for taking Diana at her most beautiful and radiant and when she had joy in her private life. Now, were you aware of the nature of her relationship with, with Dodi Fayed? I think we all know what the early stages of a relationship are like. They're very heady and very exciting. And tragically for both of them, they never got beyond that heady stage. So speculation as to what might have happened or what might not have happened is completely ridiculous in my view. Certainly none of my family are aware of any plans for them to have got married. But did you perceive her to be happier at that stage of her life than, than she'd been for a while? Actually, I'd found her to be very happy in herself in March when she came to stay with me in Cape Town. And she wasn't seeing him then. I think she'd reached a mature stage of her life where she'd got certain things in perspective and knew who she was. And um, I think that uh, she'd just sort of levelled out, uh, which is quite normal in someone who's 35, 36, whatever. Diana's lack of self-esteem, which I mean, she, she talked about it herself quite a lot. I mean, what, what do you feel was, was the root of that? I don't know. I don't know whether it was something she was born with or whether it was something that developed inside of her. But I think it's rather wonderful in a way that somebody who had so much still doubted themselves. I wouldn't see it necessarily just as a weakness. I, I think it's a fascinating part of her psychological makeup, really. Um, this beautiful, funny, intelligent spontaneous giving woman wasn't sure about herself and actually we're all like that aren't we I mean nobody's that confident about themselves and I think it shows great courage that she could face up to that I mean, everyone puts on their own mask in, in the world and um, she wasn't prepared to sort of kid herself really you've had quite a hammering in press in the last few months, I mean, you 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 descended from being this great hero to to villain, virtually. Has that been difficult to cope with? I mean, well, uh, I mean, I had one tabloid editor rang my mother during my um, divorce, uh, which sadly I'm not allowed to talk about because I'm bound to confidentiality. But the, he rang during that time, and my mother was in tears at the unfair treatment that she perceived I was getting in the papers. And she said, why do you do this to my son? And this tabloid editor said to her, because I'll never forgive him. When he made his speech, my mother cried with shame at my profession, you know, his profession being tabloid journalism. So I'm not being forgiven for that. And then my mother said, well, what are you going to do to him next? And he said, whatever his plans for the house opening, I don't care what they are, I'm going to rubbish them. Part of the perception is that, that you are not above using the media when it suits you. Um, and therefore you're a hypocrite because you lay into them at other times. I don't I don't go along with that. I mean I have I have done a, a spread on the house for instance, yes. Uh, which the money went to the to the maintenance of the house. You're talking to me here today. Oh, I yes, mean but you know arguably oh, arguably, you know, you're 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 exploiting it for your own ends. I'm not really exploiting it. I'm I'm <laughs> I'm taking the opportunity to put my aside. I think it would be unreasonable to expect me to just take everything on the chin day after day. And really the point of me talking to you today is to give people an idea of really what is going on here, uh, the ideas behind this exhibition to the memory of my sister. And um, oh, it's a chance for you to put across some of the points that uh, people might want to ask me because I don't give interviews. on this estate are extremely loyal to my family and she really couldn't be in better hands. The crucifix above the temple what next to where Diana's buried. The old carpenter who's retired came out of retirement because he wanted to do the crucifix on top of it for Diana. The forester, we were going to let some contractors come in and, and plant these trees but then the head forester said no, I've been here 34 years, this is my job. Traditional oh, yes. way of doing it. Yes, grandfather's touch. I know he wouldn't have allowed anything else. <laughs> <would he? laughs> no, no, that is the truth. 
However tastefully you do it, you're going to create a tourist attraction. You're, you're, you're creating a, a sort of tasteful Graceland. I, I'm not creating a tourist attraction. The tourists were going to come anyway if we had done nothing. What I've done is limit the number of tourists who can come. I mean, certainly if I was interested in making money or whatever, I don't think uh, I'd be a very good businessman if I just stuck to 60 days out of 365 as being but, but you're making it hugely more attractive by making such a, 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 a beautiful exhibition. I mean, it is. It's extraordinarily moving. But it doesn't matter how much more attractive I'm making it because it's still the same number of people who are coming in. I, I, there's two and a half thousand people a day, 60 days, because we know we can cope with that in a dignified manner. See, people say he's a shrewd businessman. He, he must have done his sums. He must know that this is going to set all Trump up for the future. Well, it's, uh, it's not. On the figures I've got, we're going to make quite a big loss this first year. But I don't mind that. We're still going to give a donation to the Memorial Fund. How much? Um, well, I've, uh, we're going to put a, a minimum of 10% of the ticket sale will go there this year. Well, that's, there's no profit to cover that. That's coming straight out of my pocket, I assume. Um, we, we hope that we'll be making a profit for the Memorial Fund in the second year and the third year onwards. But, I mean, I'm producing audited accounts at the end of this year to show exactly how much has been spent, where it's gone, and, you know, this is for public consumption. I think people have lost track of this. I mean, can you imagine anybody making a profit out of their brother or sister's death? It's so low, it's inconceivable. I don't know anyone who would. But because the press can present Diana as a public figure rather than as my sister, they can make it sort of a possible accusation. Whereas, of course, it's completely out of the question. I will never profit from Diana's death. What about the concert? Was that not a bit of a, a tacky idea, especially so close to her grave? Well, it's not that close to her grave. I mean, this park is the size of Monaco, <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> The point is that you can have something in the park and it's not actually sort of tripping over something else. Um, I think the, the idea of a concert is entirely suitable. Diana loved her music. And, um, I mean, every penny is going to go to the Memorial Fund and I, I think it's entirely suitable, actually. Let me ask you about the Diana Memorial Fund. What are your main objections to what's happening there? There's been no huge rift, but I wrote on behalf of my mother and my sister Jane and the three of us were concerned that the fund should remember that it's probably its prime objective is to bring it, to take in the, the money that people have given or raised for it and then to give it out. The problem that we three had was the fund and therefore Diana's name being tied up with anything that was overly commercial. And um, I think that it probably was a mistake to put her name on margarine tubs and scratch cards. I mean, I... And do you think there should be a, a, a date at which it will be terminated? Yes. I've no, I, I don't even want to say when, but... And what then happens to your profits from here, if you've got no fund? Oh, well, I give them to another, other charities, um, or even the same charities, but not via the fund. There were reports at the time that, that Prince William shared your unease. Was that true? Well, I... It's a difficult... I, I really wouldn't want to betray William's confidence. Um, but I, I think I can say that uh, he wasn't entirely unsupportive. <laughs> Since Diana's death, there's been a, a wave of conspiracy theories. Are you in any doubt in your own mind that it was anything but an accident? I, I, yeah, I'm not a believer in the conspiracy theories. And I, I think they're particularly uh, unfortunate in that it just drags everything over and over again for, for the boys more than anyone. I mean, it's desperate for them. I mean, it's not much fun for the rest of my family either. But um, I know everyone always wants a different angle on this or that, and people are sure this must have happened or that didn't happen. Well, I've, I've seen absolutely no evidence that there's any sort of conspiracy. And I'd have thought that conspiring to kill people in a very solid car in a tunnel, I mean, no, it just, it just doesn't make sense to me at all. There'd be easier ways to do it if you were going to do it. Um, and I've seen absolutely no evidence that it was anything other than uh, an accident. What about the claims that she 
uttered some last words before she died? There are no last words. There's absolutely no possibility of there having been last words. Uh, the injuries she received were such that it was just impossible for her to have uttered anything. Um, and the, the French doctors are adamant on that. And uh, my family and I believe them when they say that. It's difficult, though, when people make these claims. It's very upsetting that um, people have tried to suggest otherwise. Because, again, it's, it's so... I mean, it's baffling. Why, why would anyone want to do that, really? I mean, pretend somebody said something when they're supposedly dying. I mean, it, it's monstrous, really, isn't it? But tell me, there's nearly a, a year after her death, she continues to exert this amazing hold on the public imagination. <coughs> But there are already beginnings to be signs of a backlash, people saying they're fed up seeing her picture still in the newspapers, academics coming out and saying she's a symbol of, of a self-indulgent and, and muddled Britain. Are, are you concerned at that? Are you concerned about how history in the end will, will see Diana? I don't think anything that anyone says or does now is going to alter the impact she had. And the overwhelming impact was a positive one when she died. She would, she would have had no idea how universal the impact of her death would be. It's an extraordinary thing that she probably didn't... She had no concept of how popular she was or what she meant to people. Uh, although every day that she went to one of her engagements or every time she, she opened her mailbag, she would have been told about what people really felt about her. And it's interesting, the amount of letters I've had from members of the public who've said, I wish when she was alive, I'd told her what I really thought of her, but I never got around to it. And it's very sad, that, you know. Has it changed you? Um, well, I think I'm much more relaxed now. I used to really mind about things the whole time, and, and I've got a much more balanced view of life, I think. Uh, I find it very difficult talking about Diana sometimes, and I, and I find that the smallest thing will set me off crying or whatever. But um, overall, it's probably made me a more thoughtful person, I think. And you miss her? Yeah, very much. She's, I mean, uh, that laugh, I was watching, some, I was watching a, one of the videotapes we're showing in the museum with someone, and there's this long shot in slow motion of her laughing and laughing in, um, in a boat with the boys at an amusement park. And although it's silent, I could really hear the laugh. And it was such an intrinsic part of her. It really was a, a joyous laugh. And of course, I'll never hear that again.